Okay, so um, I'm going to do a little bit of like a visualization for us to get into the salon space. So uh, perhaps everyone can just close their eyes and um, and yeah, just let your imagination flow. Imagine you're in the early 20th century, walking through the streets of Paris. Cafes are buzzing with people chatting and laughing, while some are finding delight in an afternoon read with a cup of tea. As you walk by these cafes, the smell of sweet buttery croissants and dark roasted coffee lingers at the tip of your nose. You then stop in front of a sign that says Stein Salon. Your curiosity peaks as you hear the faint sound of lively conversations and music. So you open the door and to your surprise, Pablo Picasso walks by you with a paintbrush in his right hand and a cigarette in his left hand. The room is filled with an abundance of aesthetic experience with glorious paintings hanging up on the walls and a live, and a live jazz band playing in the background of an energetic conversation. Welcome, welcome, says Gertrude Stein, as she leads you to the conversation circle. There you find Ernest Hemingway, F. Scott Fitzgerald, James Joyce, Henry Matisse, and a few other prominent intellectuals and avant-garde artists of the time. Picasso enters into the circle and sits, sits down with a big sigh as he asks, do you think I've had an impact on the world? Joyce offers you a cup of coffee. As you sip on it, Fitzgerald says, why, of course, Pablo, your art evokes a deep sense of playfulness in people. Hemingway jumps in and says, indeed, I would say you've had an integral impact on the world. Mm -hmm. Joyce drops in with a question, integral? What do we mean by that? Yes, good question, says Matisse. And how does one create integral impact? As the group ponders in silence, Stein energetically says, well, it looks like we found our topic of discussion, integral impact. Shall we begin? All right. We damn shall. <laughs> okay, so we are, beginning our salon and I would like to I just want to say that I'm I'm really not trying to facilitate this whole thing I just I want it to flow and so anyone bring in questions or take it in any direction that you like I will just start with this question and I think we have talked about it a lot but it, you know it doesn't get boring because it's a very interesting one what what is what does being integral mean to you and how has your time at CIS what 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 has your time with CIS taught you about being integral? So if anyone wants to jump in. Oh. Sorry, can you just say that question again? Yeah, it's it's kind of like a two part question, and it it basically is first. Okay, let's let's maybe start with the first one. What does integral mean to you? And if you prefer to answer the second one, that's also fine. What has your time with CIS, being a student at CIS taught you about being integral? Because integral is in, this, is in the name of our, of our school. And so what, what has that taught you? Integral to me is um, based in an evolutionary concept. So it's in its definition, it's evolving. Like the minute it stops evolving, it loses its integral in integrality. Um, so that's the number one thing for me. But more sort of scientifically, I would say integral is a deeper entrance into reality in that it unites um, various uh, methods of knowledge, so experience, thought, um, memory, 
all these different things that constitute the human being and how those capacities allow us to experience the world as a multifaceted organism that's developing. I think integral can help us. It is a deepening, it's an initiative of deepening into those um, strata of reality and uniting them so that our consciousness can become more multidimensional and less um, dogmatic and limited to specific realms of experience or validation. And I guess my time at CIS has been an expression of living into integral consciousness, um, you know, drawing from a lot of different wisdom traditions, engaging with a lot of different people who have different mindsets. Um, it's the CIS experience is an experience, hopefully, of um, a higher level of, of social exchange that um, is fundamentally grounded in being interested in the human being and our relationship to the world and the cosmos. Yeah, thank you, Lucien. That's that's really beautiful. Um, you know, as you're speaking, I'm. I know we're in our integral yoga psychology class together. So Lucien and I have been in a semester, uh, you know, uh, of, of discussing this with uh, Debashish, the EWP professor. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on, on like interacting and understanding a human being in a in a more integral dimension of life versus because I think we well this is something we can talk about does integral mean plural and and if that's the case then what is it like to interact with people in a more relativistic world versus a plural world how do you know that you are participating in a more integral way with someone versus a more postmodern way Are you asking me specifically? No, I'm I, anyone, and if you okay. have, if you want to answer, you can go ahead. Well, I was still thinking about I was just kind of marinating on integral impact, and I think it is. Um, or I'm vibing on um, having introduced some principle that makes relating to oh rachel um, sorry um, out for a second okay. uh, but so I, I was saying that integral impact for me would be embracing some principle or body of knowledge um or but yeah, I really like this concept of embracing some principle that allows me to relate to the different aspects of my being in a more pleasing way. Sorry, could you say that last part in a more, in a more pluralistic way? Is that what you said? Does anyone, did anyone hear what she said? I think it's like more pleasing way. Oh, okay. Right. I said way yeah. Okay. yeah yes okay thank you um yeah does anyone have any have any thoughts to share a more pleasing way i like that yeah i i think <clears throat> i was thinking for me integral is is about reunion um that unity um, you know, before coming to CIS, I feel like a lot of the spiritual things that I was finding outside of kind of like, oh, this is spirituality, not religion. Um, it was still a lot of uh, moving away from the body. And I feel like now there is this movement of the unity of the human being includes all of the aspects of what it means to have a human experience. And a component of that is the organic being. Um, and with that comes all of the organicness of just nature being like, okay, well, then 
we are just part of all of nature. It's all one being that is then coming forth in the human. Um, so when Rachel was, was saying, you know, with um, finding a principle that allows her to relate to different aspects of herself in a pleasing way, I think what is included in that different aspects of the self, I think for me, is the question with integral to to find that wholeness and and you know we we've kind of done very good at identifying the different parts but in the identification of the parts we have disowned it um and i feel like now we're in the process of bringing it back through and and, and owning bringing ownership of those parts of ourselves even the shadows and the ugly parts and um that wholeness the reunion with the wholeness yeah that's beautiful Aya. thank you and and i'm i'm wondering like do are those aspects are those parts infinite or do you have a good idea and does everyone here if you're thinking i also i think before i came to to cis i had an idea of what it meant to be an integral person and i'll share that with you but i saw it as like three or four dimensions so i'm wondering uh what what everyone here See, how, sees those aspects as is it is it is it finite is it infinite do you already have a set of criteria for yourself of what it means to be integral I can share with you that before coming to CIS I thought that an integral person is someone who is aligned with the cosmological the ecological and the psychological societal economic dimension, though, like just all those dimensions in life. And I felt that I was completely in the social, let's say, okay, let's say cosmological, social, and ecological were the three main dimensions that I thought that one had to participate with in order to be integral. And I felt that I was really only living in the social dimension. And social would include economics, would include culture, um, uh, politics. And, and so I felt, what, well, what, what can I do to be more ecological and cosmological? The ecological part I feel is still opening up for me, but the cosmological part I wasn't expecting to to be so prominent, um, you know, for as I came into CIS, and it has because of astrology. And now I do really feel like I'm living in a cosmological universe because I'm I'm, I'm checking my transits. I'm you know I'm trying to bring the planets into the work that I'm doing. So that part really seems to be opening up for me, um, and. And so I wonder whether once I get a hang on the ecological aspect, will I suddenly feel like a, a divine integral being? Will, will I start shining? I don't know. So, you know, what what do you all have to say about your dimensions? Do you even have those? Or do you think it's, it's too limiting to even have that? I, I, I think it is infinite. That's, I think it is infinite. And I think, I, I, I think that, um, I think that's why, you know, for all of what is undiscovered, I think that principle that I'm now open to would allow me to take any aspect of myself, like now, like consciously experienced or otherwise, like my anger for existence, how can I relate to my anger in a more pleasing way <clears throat> or fears or my wrong, like my, my sexual experience, my uh, spiritual aspects, my intellectual aspects, how can I relate to those parts of myself in a, in a pleasing way? I think there are probably dimensions and aspects I, I am yet to discover or consciously experience or experience in some other way. Um, but again, I, I do, you know, for whatever those are discovered and undiscovered still, um, if I can relate to that, to those parts of myself in a way, um, and I, I really narrowed in on that word pleasing because it is so personal, um, to my, it feels very personal for me, um, and pleasing, 
Um, to me, the idea of what brings me pleasure has really, really, really expanded um, throughout <laughs> all of this um, reflection that we've all been doing together. So I'm, I learned how to take pleasure in my artistic fears, for example, um, like learning to embrace the squizzle, learning to love that squizzle um, is like the, a mantra I've kept and it was now relating to an unknown part of myself in a way that um, feels freeing and new and creative, all of those, all of that stuff pleasing to me, even though it was an area of my life where I felt very unsure before. So, Thank you, Rachel. Um, I really, I actually really do like that aspect as well that you brought up about, you know, relating to all those dimensions in the most pleasing way possible. But as you speak, I'm also wondering, and, and, and you know, you can clarify, and I think, I think Abir might even support this, um, that relating to fear in a pleasing way. I, wa I wonder, just a question, whether that's doing an injustice to fear itself, whether fear is in a place that cannot be, cannot be related to in a pleasing way. And could that in itself be integral because integral is open, as Lucien said, to infinite possibilities. And that one, of, one aspect of that infinite possibility is fear itself, the way fear feels. So that's just something I'm putting out there. I don't, I, I wonder how you feel about that or if anyone else has to say something to that. This actually um, really relates to what we've been talking about in integral yoga psychology. And I'm, my impulse is that um, kind of going off this fear as pleasure, um, like how can fear be transmuted into an experience of bliss? As Devashish might say. Um, it's almost like uh, to be fearful, how can, I, I feel like the, the pleasure and fear can come through um, an overmind understanding of fear as an opportunity for love, for deepening love by transmuting fear. So maybe in that, in the opportunity of fear, that's where the bliss comes in, but the fear itself never is pleasurable. It's just what is just in front of the fear as, a, as the transformational alchemical activity that is the pleasure of fear. Um, and maybe seeing things, maybe seeing things in sort of their, their subtle qualitative organization is also integral, like not um, washing everything out into pleasure or pain or enthusiasm or discomfort or whatever, but like really seeing sort of, I don't know if you imagine a, a Matisse painting, like shapes, subtle shapes in, in, integrating and relating to one another in their, in their fullness, but also um, that their fullness in relationship to each other is an integral social behavior, like how to honor each, each color and each form um, but experience the in-between of them and not just get fixated on their individualities. Yeah, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, well, I was just thinking, you know, what was integral, like when I came to CIS, if I was coming for ideas, you know, but I got a worldview as, you know, you put it. And uh, it felt like I was only listening to the world through one ear. You know, and I didn't even know that there was this whole other way of knowing, which for me was my body, you know, like I didn't know that my body had so much information to give, uh, including the larger body of which, you know, we're all a part, uh, the things around us, the ecology around us. So uh, it seemed like becoming integral was about opening up to like how much more information there is than just what I thought there was for my materialist educational upbringing, which was very mental and focused on ideas and 
there was a very strong relationship to material possessions, not the deep spirituality of the material object. Like today I found my way back to it. You know, like if I have a favorite cologne in the past, I may have just been like, oh, this is some expensive cologne, so it's cool. But now that cologne has a life of its own. You know, it has a spiritual message. It has a cosmic message, right? That occurs in between its chemical composition and how I'm experiencing it. Um, so that's a that's a bit of thoughts on integral. You know, this architect that you always talk about certainly is coming to mind, the Engels, you know. I try and read this book a couple of minutes every day. And um, you know, what he does is this thing called like hedonistic utopia, right? And so he tries to integrate all the feedback into creating his designs. So this, this one particular, um, I guess it's a, a, a viewing platform in New York. You know, I don't know if you can really see it, but this page itself describes this idea that it looks like a Dorito chip, you know, and it's kind of raised up, but it ended up this way, not out of any aesthetic consideration. It was actually trying to just integrate all the regulations around uh, the fire code and, you know, like city permits and just like forcing all of those constraints into a dialogue resulted in this structure emerging. And that's what uh, I'm feeling in this moment, hearing everybody speak that for me, what I want to try and be with integral is to force all the constraints to accept every opinion, which is the lesson of the postmodern, right? Because modernity was so fixed. It was like Catholic church is correct or science is correct. And then postmodern was like, well, Catholic church is correct, but Hinduism is also correct and indigenous is also correct. So nobody is correct. And that is a place where many people are. And so how do we move past that is to say, okay, everybody is correct, but I have a sense of values and purpose within all of this correctness, you know? And so I'm just having this sense of what Rachel described as uh, pleasure being a, a sense of direction within all this diversity. How do I open myself up to as much of it as possible, uh, but still having an intuitive sense of how to integrate it. And something Lucien said I appreciated was that integration is not about colonization, right? It's not about any one value, I think, such as love, overwhelming everything else, you know, like fear is a cosmic reality. And if I'm gonna try and wallpaper it over and make it into friendship, you know, that's, I don't, to me, that doesn't feel integral. So it's like, how do I hold fear and love and friendship and all of these realities without letting them collapse my individual identity. It's by having a sense of intuitive direction through them. So I really like that architect a lot because he really forces himself to like pull all the feedback and then just see what comes from that. Um, so yeah. Thank you, Abir, for, for bringing in Ingels and um, for your um, one comment as well. Um, I, yeah, I do appreciate what Lucien said as well. And I'm, you know, I, I think I do have a tendency to try and be like the devil's advocate a little bit, but um, <laughs> you, I mean, you just said, you know, you were, you were, Lucien, you were, um, you brought in Devashisha's idea of like, you know, enabling pain to feel like bliss now wouldn't you say that 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 then bliss is is colonizing all other emotions well um i would say that this gets this gets back to like bliss being the eternal highest archetype of the cosmos that like descends into its multifaceted pain kind of um, but that's more from integral yoga. I'm not, I haven't experienced the bliss as the foundation of the cosmos. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really interesting to, 
to inquire into a sort of colonizing quality. Um, and yeah, once again, how can, what does, it, what does the human being look like? What does the human being experience when there isn't a colonizing quality? When um, qualities are honored in their realness and yet don't, don't overwhelm the individuality. Is that an integral approach? Um, and is that sustainable also, considering qualities that are disruptive and traumatic? Um, but I think that's a really important inquiry because that's the, the reality of the world that we are constantly confronted by a um, variety of qualities that we have to handle. And maybe to recognize our impulses to colonize certain qualities and and um, be, become blind to them through protective mechanisms uh, is, is worth self-reflecting on in our daily behavior. I'm trying to think about how we can have, because we're trying to say, okay, like there is this multiplicity and we're bringing it together. Um, so we are kind of calling for structure and that blurriness of it. Um, and so then like, you know, there's this question of, do we allow fear? Do we feel fear on its, all of its fullness or uh, do we meet it with love? And I wonder if there is a, a way where we can be talking about fear as a, um, like an ideal out there versus an experience within us. And is it possible for us to full on experience fear without falling apart? So then does that love come in to create a container where we can actually experience the darkness without being completely overwhelmed by it? So we're kind of, it's creating space to feel the fear in versus colonizing it and like taking it over. Um, Cause I can from one side see it kind of like the fear comes up and you meet it like a fearful child and you're trying to hold space for it. But at the same time, I understand in, you know, um, when we, with Groff's work with the psychedelic psychotherapy, the whole point is you go and meet that fear head on and experience it as if for the first time. And it's all about the full on experience. So then it gets this confusion of how much are we um, allowing the fear to come up? How much are we trying to help it stay contained? Um, so then that kind of made me think about systems theory um, where things are seen as relationships rather than things in themselves. They are just relationship between other things. And then when you look at those things, they're relationship between other things. So there's this fractal relationshipness that's going on rather than thingness. Um, so then I was trying to figure out like how much, perhaps that's what we, what's this conversation is like where does the where do we put the relationships limits of like should we keep it here or should we go deeper into it or should we allow it to come does it come into the consciousness or do we go meet it in the unconsciousness where does the relationship happen how does the relationship happen um and i guess you know how do we meet these things without like dissociating from them or trying to overshadow them with another emotion in a, in a colonizing like sorts of way yeah, this seems really uh, fruitful and that organic feeling we're like bringing up of the body, you know, Aya, which you brought up, it seems so relevant to this, like life is a poem, you know, like you have a, a couple of years of your life where you're so deep into art and then you have, suddenly you hate it and, and now you're like artist, it needs to be art and music and sculpture and I got so obsessed for a while, wow, how stupid and then couple of years later, you've left the arts behind and now you're a mathematician for like 20 years, you know? And so I think there's a mystery to the human, like holotropic, that word means like moving towards wholeness. And within a psychedelic state, you're opening, you're trusting your consciousness to give itself what it needs to heal, right? So that's where I think Groff has that sense of deeply going into whatever is emerging because that is what your psyche needs to return to a sense of wholeness. But that process is so messy and uh, not clean. And I think it involves periods of surrendering yourself, abandoning yourself, and then periods of coming back to yourself and 
trying to hold everything. Um, but one phrase I like a lot is like, as a tourist, you know, like that's my, like I use that, like to, to meet the fear as a tourist, right? Like if you were to go visit like the savannah of, of Africa, you really opening yourself up to it, but you still have a sense that you're just visiting it so that you still have a sense of who you are through the, the craziness. Thank you. Um, I just want to, I know Tiffany and, J and Jamie just jumped in. So I just want to uh, get you both on board where we're right now, we're just, you know, discussing like what integral means to us, what CIS has taught us about what it means to be integral. So we're kind of going down a little bit of a philosophical path right now, but that, but that's really where the gems lie, I think. So, and then we're gonna move on to what it what it means to create impact, and then combining these two. So, uh, you know, I think Tiffany or Jamie, if you would like to share, or those who haven't yet shared their thoughts, please, please do. We wanna, you know, this is what it means to be integral is is the plurality, and so we want everyone's voices in this. So, if anyone, yeah, who joined wants to share. Well, what does integral mean to you and what has CIS taught you about it? I, I would love to jump in and just say that I really connected with what Aya said. Um, and the concept that fear needs a container. Um, and, and I feel like, I feel like the column, I don't just feel <laughs> my research this semester specifically has led me down the, um, the path of, of understanding that the colonizing, um, the need to colonize comes from fear and is fear unbridled, is fear unchecked, um, is fear uncontained and trying to find a, an outlet um, for itself. And so what I said about um, about love being a container for fear really spoke to me. Um, yeah, that's it. Beautiful. Thank you, Jodi Ann. Well, I guess for the sake of putting my voice into the room. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Tiffany, and I've been a student at CIAS for 10 years now. And um, I kind of came out, came to the school through very informal coffee, ca cafe conversations with neighbors. And one of them had introduced me to integral philosophy and integral psychology by way of Ken Wilber. And um, that, you know, Ex opened me up to a bunch of other, you know, interpretations of integral, including um, the CI. It actually brought me to CIS, um, and um, I think I still, you know, still unpacking to this, like, you know, what is what is integral? What is it's almost a sensation to me at this point. Um, it's like this cohesion and acceptance of, of the, a plurality um, by way of, of, you know, not just our mental knowing, but our, our emotional knowing and our collective consciousness and our physical being. And yeah, I've been in a real embodiment stage. I feel like I can't go any further intellectually. Um, and my writing is, <laughs> you know, it's, um, almost stopped because I think I need to be really going into a deeper feeling place. And um, yeah, that's uh, the integral landscape um, and the potential of what integralness <laughs> could become, I think is something that's always been um, a really important conversation, you know, in the halls and um, in these types of spaces. So thank you so much, Somia, for bringing everyone together on this topic. And um, so far, I've just really enjoyed hearing people's responses. So I'll go back to listening and um, yeah, just appreciate meeting you all here. So 
what Tiffany just said helped me helped me um, kind of pull together a second thought um, around that same concept. Um, that the colonizing impulse as well, the, the fear is not just a, it, it can be a, um, a vague fear of unknown, but I feel like it's very much attached to embodiment. So, so, so that to me speaks of being integral, right? I mean, embodiment has to be a part of being integral for me. And, and that kind of goes back to um, something made me prickle at a beer's mention of uh, postmodernism and, uh, and all things being true. And I think it's um, a lot of my master's work was done around postmodern literature and postmodern uh, lit crit theory. And there's a moral relativism to postmodernism and the belief that all things are tr equally true that I could not abide anymore after that work. Um, and I think that's what brought me to critical theory. So I'm kind of now in my work here tempering that, that postmodern impulse with critical theory as a way of understanding how to decolonize my mind or stay away from the colonizing impulse. I don't, I don't know. I mean, that's just all what's coming up. I don't think there's any clarity there, but that's just what's coming up. <laughs> and for some reason, I just really felt compelled to share that. <laughs> Thank you both, Tiffany and Jodi Ann. Anyone else want to want to share a little bit? I'm I'm kind of looking at Sarah right now, but if anyone, if Sarah, if you're not going to share, okay. I don't have anything particularly coherent or wise to say, but I wanted to pick up on what Tiffany and Jodi Ann have just said because I I've been thinking a lot about the mechanism. Like that's not really the right word, but like the process of of uh, the evolution of consciousness and like the the individual or humanity or whatever and thinking about the <clears throat> the relationship between surrender and resistance and how um, resistance is about control and colonization is about control so the idea of decolonizing my my mind and I that just sort of clicked in there for me for a moment when I was thinking about like the the surrender and resistance and I was thinking about uh, surrender as I was reading about um, in the radiance of being Sri Aurobindo's notion of evolution as the divine there's the divine within that is captured within it's held by the material world part of me and then there's the greater higher my dog is is insistent it's insistent insistent <laughs> her little divine flame wants to go for a walk um and how there the higher is like a pull there's a pull on my inner divine of my soul that is sort of covered by I don't know, the material, either the ego or the whatever, and that there's this pull. And as the pull gets greater than my ability to constrain or re restrain, then there's surrender and I move closer by letting go of those physical material kind of constructs. And the, the thing that interested me about what you said, Tiffany, is that uh, like when I arrived here, I have no concept of like I knew that it, in my mind that I, I wanted to experience the sort of the integration of mind and body, but I didn't really know how to do that. And it wasn't really a part of my life or my practice in a meaningful way. And so I've been really working on that. And so when you said that you got to a freeze point, I noticed that in that surrender moment that I was exploring that one of the consequences of it was this like stop of flow and I wondered about the the 
the connection between um, surrender and uh, restraint or control and the voice and, and writing, because writing is really, writing from my authentic voice is an act of, I don't know, of um, surrender to that or something. Well, I don't know what that means in the grand sphere of this conversation, but that's what uh, comes to mind for me. I, I guess I just also think about like the, the the things that Lucien has done with us in trying to connect to that inner flame that is covered up and disguised and protected and armored up through all of my life experiences and now the the work to call in there and go hello down there what do you want to say Lucien is here bullying bullying. I don't know there's something in that that relates to this uh, integral something. Yeah, actually, Sarah, while you were speaking, I was, this phrase came up for me, um, who are we with each other? It seems, I mean, in my experience of CIS relationships and um, people outside of CIS, the, the most profound spiritual experiences are actually just by virtue of being in relationship with another. Um, and even if they're not these like exalted personal experiences of the divine, they're, um, they're bringing the divine into life in a way that like creates every human being into a transparent portal into self-awareness and social awareness. Um, so yeah, how does, how does, how can we carry the integral into the practice of a true social framework where um, our relationship in the context of the whole is actually a cosmic relationship that isn't, um, yeah, bound by the egoity of the body, of the actual condition of the body as a separate object. How can we like transcend that that reality that we actually are? Um, so that that came up for me while you were speaking. Really profound questions. Um, I I think when when Jodi Ann was was speaking, um, you know, you you mentioned embodiment. How do we how do we begin to really embody this this idea and and then what, what came up for me is that, well, how did we begin to, because we're all, I, I think from a Western perspective, we're all emerging out of like a scientific materialistic paradigm. How, what does it mean to even embody a scientific worldview? Because that's what we, that's what we're coming out of. So that means we have embodied that, we are embodying that. And now we're trying to embody the integral. And and just so that we can now move into the impact part, science has clearly had such a huge impact on, on humanity, on, on, on evolution, on, uh, of, on civilization. Did, you know, my question is, and I don't really know if this is a really good question, but maybe someone can help me. Did, did we embody that as, as, a, as a modern Western society? Is it because we embodied it that we were able to create impact? And does creating impact mean that one has to embody it? What is embodiment? These are my questions. I wanted to just uh, refer to some what Tiffany brought up about feeling so exhausted by the intellect. And I think there's really something to that. You know, I don't know if it's a phase of a couple of years or a few decades or like something that's opening up for the next few centuries uh, for humanity, but. Um, I think of those vegetables or fruits, which are like the ugly ones, which they don't carry in grocery stores, you know, like weird carrots and weird potatoes, you know, and that's so real. And there's something about the intellect, which is so sanitized. It wants to strip itself of the ugliness and the deformity and the awkwardness of being human. I'm not sure why we ended up there. Um, but it seems like it's tapped out, you know, and the richness, the aliveness 
is somewhere from just the experience. You know, I'm, I, I've, I've been researching Cologne a lot these days. So it's like my mind is very often there. And I know like it's, it could also talk about psychedelics, you know, like you can take like a huge dose and, you know, do the wrong, like eat a big meal right before it or not be in the right mindset. And it, it'll just wash over you as if you didn't really matter. And you can take a, a microdose and really be there for it and really try to harness your intellect into this more embodied center where you're really feeling into the moment. You know, you're watching the clouds and you're like really allowing the clouds to affect you. Um, so that's an element of surrender. You know, that's something about surrendering to it, but also you are there. You know, you're not just washed away in, in, in the world. So there's this element of participatory, which Jorge Ferrer really carries, an EWP professor, um, participation. Um, so those those are just some some thoughts that are coming to mind of of a much more intuitive place, a feeling place uh, where the aliveness is. And yet at the same time, it's not about reverting back to the superstition of the medieval era, right? Like I don't think integral is about just wiping the slate clean. I think it's about moving forward. Um, but it's really healing, I find, to think of that embodied self, which is not so smart, it's not super sharp, it's not so competent, it's not the best of the best in the world. It just is, you know, it just is. It's just, it wakes up, it's hungry, you look at the sun, you know, you had a nice moment, you felt a bit angry, like it just is. And there's something so real about that isness. I, I kind of wonder, Jamie, did you want to talk? I just wanted to kind of throw something else in, but go ahead, Jodianne. That's fine. Um, hi, Rachel. <laughs> Welcome. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I struggle a little bit with this because I feel like, so I come from the scientific world and I just feel like science is a framework and, but it's been um, taken over by like a capitalistic model like I, I don't feel like science is a problem like truly science is about observation it's maybe like poorly done it's about control and repeating um but I, I really feel like it's about um you know observing our natural world understanding it it's about curiosity but when you have it interwoven with capitalism then is when it becomes um something really problematic and um, that attempts to control the way we look, to control the way we behave, control uh, who gets to be um, in a population of people. And, um, you know, going here to what you said about the wanting to extract the ugly and the, the, um, the um, you know, unacceptable. Um, but I do feel like true science, like true spirituality is just gets corrupted by um, the the current model of, of what our humanity is. And so like, I think there is a place for science in an embodied um, integral experience. And I think that that is really critical and in, into how we bring it in. It's still about curiosity of the natural world, about our bodies, about learning and about, um, you know, uh, doing that in a way that also allows for a lot of unknowing, a lot of um, experiences of uh, mystical ideas and, and just holding space for that too. So that and, and um, you know, that's all I'll say now, but uh, thank you. I'm so glad I deferred to you because you said what what needed to be said before I could say what I want to say, which is giving us that framework for um, the capitalist model of science. That that was my response to Somia was um, I would disagree that we've embodied um, Western science. I would I would argue that um, that Western philosophy uh, leading to colonization, leading to capitalization, shuts down embodiment. Um, and and shuts down embodiment through labeling bodies, as Abir mentioned, and as Jamie mentioned, um, and deciding which bodies are valuable, which are not, 
which are um, acceptable and in what ways. And I feel like there's something in being integral that gives us agency to name our own experience, our own embodiment and what that means for us as opposed to having, and this goes back to that colonization, having someone else put that experience on us or put that label on us. Yeah, I yeah, think- Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Avir. Okay, uh, so, uh, you know, what Jamie was saying, it, rem it makes me think of Marcel Duchamp's uh, fountain in 1910, where he just found a urinal and he just displayed it as a uh, found object and that broke the world of art and art was forced to then come back to embrace this whole notion of found objects as being part of art, you know? And I think that's one of the challenges facing science is like true science should be open to investigation and the true scientists are, you know, and the problem becomes when it ends up becoming dogmatic and entire doors of exploration are shut because that's not art, you know? Uh, like astrology, like astrology is an observational science we don't have any instruments that can measure it, only human perception. So what does it take for science to continue regenerating itself to fulfill its, its, uh, its, its mission? Um, and I, I was also having this, I, I haven't studied enough feminism and feminist theory to, to handle this like the most astutely, but I do have this sense that there is something about uh, patriarchy in a certain way, which has shut down the power of the body in favor of the mind. Uh, and there's something about intuition and emotions in a very cliched way being relegated to like, oh, that's a, that's a feminine trait. That's not a serious trait, you know? So I know there's a lot of different schools of thought around that, but I think part of coming back into contact with the body is, is part of reclaiming the feminine uh, power of the, of the cosmos, you know? Uh, beyond gender, it's, 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 it's just another side of the cosmos sort of thing. Yes, and, and um, I, I really appreciate Jamie and um, Jodi and what you brought up, and maybe I wasn't, I wasn't so clear. Um, I think I was mostly referring to the fact that, that, you know, like the scientific revolution, it, it, and especially, I mean, you're right, Jodi, and it is more Western philosophy because we can see this when it with with Descartes, you know, the the separation between the object and the subject. Like that's really what I'm referring to, and the mind that constantly wants to measure, and then believes that what you are measuring is is different from you. That that the that the person who is me measuring can be outside of the universe and look at the universe and measure it without in without thinking that their own being has no influence. On the universe that that's really what i was getting at that is the that is the scientific mind the embodiment that we carry that you and i and of course there's a reality to it there, there's that tension that i think the integral worldview needs to hold is that of course this is me and you are you and there's some sort of separation but at the same time underneath it all there's this hidden layer of connectivity that that is holding us together how does how can we so how does the integral consciousness hold that tension because you don't want to just like merge into everything and be like hey you are me and you know people will think you're crazy I mean so how you know that that's really what I'm what I was kind of questioning and so I, I do appreciate um you know you bringing both of you bringing up those points and helping me to clarify that in a beer as well thank you this is also kind of just to kind of deepen this and re-emphasize it um, it's almost like how has um, a scientific, an empirical scientific re revolution um, actually transformed our consciousness to an object consciousness of measure and weight? And what can we imagine what the experience of being embodied was before that shift happened? Um, can we experience the, the experience the profoundness of that difference? Um, and in that, that way, I think that we can see um, sort of a, like a form of the embodiment of the current scientific model is an embodiment of abstraction as opposed to an embodiment of um, a living experience of, of truth. 
it's kind of like we're constantly abstracting our experience into um, conceptual frameworks of identity um, as opposed to um, a, an, a truly embodied experience of a deeply mystical body that um, can be calculated and measured and weighed, but um, also extends into realms that cannot be. Um, and how does that deepen our embodiment to not be measured in a way? Um, thank you so much for that. I, I was suddenly reminded of uh, Brian Swim, and then you said what you said, and I was like, that's exactly uh, what he would be talking about. Because, <laughs> um, you know, I, I can see the sunset behind Sarah, and, um, you know, there is this thing of like, oh, the sun is setting, even though we all intellectually know that we are moving away from the sun and the sun is not setting. Um, so Brian Swim always talks about this, this lack of embodiment of uh, the modern scientific stuff that we have. Um, like we know what is actually happening out there in the cosmos, but our language still doesn't reflect it. And we don't um, interact, we know, you know, he talks about go out there and, you know, watch the stars and, um, you know, uh, focus on Venus with the sun going down or something like that when, when Venus is like in the horizon and you can really get a sense of the earth is moving and you can have this embodiment of this is a moving creature and I'm sitting on it and I'm just moving away from the sun. Um, so there's even the, the stuff that we do know, we haven't embodied it. We have this very intellectual understanding of this is what's happening. Um, and today I was reading, um, I think it's the web of life um, and you know, there was this, this mention of um, there was a separation in science between fact and uh, morality, where, where fact is a thing that science discovers and has nothing to do with morality. Um, and we can kind of like see like we haven't really put all of these things that we're finding into our understanding of well, what does that mean for us here on this earth? We haven't even brought into our conversations, into our language. Um, of there is this separation between what we find about the world and what that actually means about our place in that world and what that embodiment would look like. Um, so I don't know how, how, how much we have actually embodied it. I think we have really intellectually understood it. We can talk about it. And, um, you know, there's even this thing of like, you feel really like awakened if you can talk about it, like, oh yeah, we're all one. Um, other people not, don't even agree with that. So we kind of feel great like that we can talk about it and understand that it's that we're all one, but we don't feel like we're all one. We haven't really um, dropped into it in that, in that sense of um, when, when you might be, if you're like on a psychedelic and you go outside and you just really feel like, wow, this is just life. Like I am here in this moment, the moment is emerging. I am a part of it. Like my mind isn't somewhere else. It's right here with the body with the now and like, oh my God, it's alive. And this just like feeling of like, wow, like I'm awake. I, <laughs> uh, and I feel like that's embodiment. That's how I, I understand it, embodiment of like just being exactly where you are doing exactly what you're doing and not anything else. Um, I don't know how much it's, it's doable on a daily basis. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, that's all I have to say. I was thinking about what you're you're talking about, like the language and like even our conversation right now is very intellectual. Like we're talking about our thoughts and I'm wondering like what is the what what are the embodied experiences or what is the I don't what's the question of this moment for each person. One of the things that I find really interesting is um, hearing people speak to like what is the embodied what's the body experience of this moment what about you Somya? what's your body body experience in this moment I I feel a lot of um like my heart is like racing and I'm just feeling a lot of excitement because like I said something and now I want to say something so I feel like my intellect is really just like I'm drowning in my intellect I don't know or maybe I'm just like a child with like just so much curiosity ah! <laughs> that's the feeling that I'm that I'm going through my so yeah I, I it's hard for me to say because I I can't seem to I can't seem to separate my intellect from my my body unless I'm not thinking 
at all. Like unless I'm really doing something that doesn't require any thought. Just so in this moment, yeah, that's all I can say. I just feel a lot of excitement. My heart is racing and, you know, I, I feel hunger. I actually feel a lot of hunger for life. That is what it is. Um, and, and, you know, I just want to, I know Tiffany, you have to leave and I, I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm kind of intuiting that you want to share something. And if you, if, if you're not, then I'm sorry, I totally was wrong. So I just want to make sure that. Actually, you intuited that I had wanted to see if Rachel wanted to say something because you unmuted a while ago. And I just, I oh, wanted wow. to see if you had something to, to share. Yeah, I don't know if I was gonna share it, but you grabbed it and are pulling it out. So yeah, um, I'm however here having a lot of feelings. I'm getting angry, I'm feeling triggered, I'm having all this stuff, I'm feeling guilty. I'm not feeling that intellectual. And part of it is like what, what came up for me was I just, I work in mental health and we, you know, we talk about trauma. We talk about, um, I actually work in crisis services and we talk about how if people do not feel safe, they cannot learn like emotional, emotionally safe, physically safe, they cannot learn. And so it's, I'm really triggered by this, even this idea of academia, intellectualism, Western ideology. It's so lacking because there are so many people that are not safe. So what are we missing in, like, in terms of academic observation, um, intellectual advancement, development, and like, you know, our capacities growing? Um, like we're missing so much because there are so many people who are not safe. And when people are not safe, they shut down. I mean, we've had from macro to micro experiences with this. I'm sure all of us, I'm, it, and I'm, I'm just so, I'm, I, I think I feel guilty because here I am having this conversation. I'm part of a highly traumatized population. I mean, I'm, I, I just, I feel so sad. I feel so sad because, um, yeah, there's just a richness of humanity that is just been, uh, you know, that's just, that's just missing still as beautiful as life is, our world is, our communities are. There's just a richness that is missing because so many people are, um, don't feel safe, just in the essence, just don't feel safe. And that just really, um, it just really stunts our growth. And I think about, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's like, I'm just kind of, I'm just thinking about this. I, I just, I feel really conflicted sometimes, you know, um, I just feel really, you know, I have to keep reminding myself that, um, you know, I, I think what I, I struggle with is how do I relate to myself as this as an individual um, that is like this free bird um, without feeling so compartmentalized. Um, going back to integral, like the, in this idea of what is integral. It is a really challenging experience to integrate the Western labels of the being that I am. That's really, really challenging. Um, so something really, so, um, you know, that idea of, of are we embodying or are we failing to embody is really, really, um, that's a, that's really interesting and provocative to me, but I am just really 
have been so tapped into this collective anxiety um, and it really hasn't gone away. And I think that's what is crystallizing for me is that I think about how have I been stunted? And again, how have we all been stunted by this pervasive um, lack of safety um, throughout the world? And when we think about the ancient cultures that um, are represented amongst whole bodies of people that are presently living in fear, and so we haven't had the opportunity for a wholesome, intentional exchange of wisdom because we've all, you know, these cultures have experienced being like pillaged. Um, and then what a wonderful, what a beautiful thing to think about if we could have an open exchange of information that was truly um, reciprocal, equitable. Um, I think a lot of that kind of like, I think a lot of the um, spiritual, esoteric kind of reachings of all of our minds, like there's nothing new under the sun. And like, like, there's just nothing new under the sun. And we have not allowed ourselves to just go humbly to the centers of very different, you know, varying centers of, of ancient wisdom. We've not gone humbly to these centers. We have had come with little understanding and taken what we thought we wanted and called it what we wanted and named it what we wanted and I'm just gonna pause. <laughs> I'm just gonna pause. <laughs> so I can grab the plug out and just pause. But yeah, so I was over here feeling a lot of stuff. Thank you for sharing, Rachel. I'm sorry for putting you on the spot in any way, but I appreciate it's you totally okay. cool. bringing that into the into the room. And I want to validate that the the feeling of not like people not feeling safe is a real threat of of danger, and that's not just something that's made up. That's something that you know is felt and experienced and intergenerational. Um, so um, I just want to honor um, and appreciate you bringing that reality. I also speak from a lot of privilege. Like I I recognize the privilege that I hold. Um, but there was just something really interesting about um, this connection that I feel like a lot of human beings have had recently throughout the world. And like, what what is it? Oh, shoot. Oh, man. Oops. Just that we've had, I've like, sense this real connection amongst human beings like all around the world and I just you know it's very interesting that you know it was all around so much pain somehow and then again you know just going back to kind of what you know I think what I was talking about earlier how can I relate to these different aspects of myself in a way that is pleasing for me and um just like in raw real time you know um i can appreciate that uh, i can appreciate in myself that um empathy you know and being able to express you know, fear, discontent, et cetera, is a, is a sign of empathy, so. Words, little word salad, little bit word salad. I'm just feeling really, I'm feeling really activated in my body. Mm. 
I just keep thinking about the things you're saying as embracing this underlying stratum of um, like this this condition of the world that is is all about separation. Like we're we're physically separated from everyone, and just to see that in its in its multiple forms, separation of class, ethnicity, gender, body, um, continents, like it seems like something in that foundational structure of the earth is really a pain structure. It's like a, it's a structure of pain kind of. And what if human consciousness is, is like a evolution of transcending that separate pain and and are we going to i feel like we're going to continue to experience more and more pain as we actually overcome that separateness which is why i feel like right now in the world when there's a a new kind of global consciousness that that's rising more than ever before in tandem with that there's like a heightened absurdity of trauma that is almost like a revelation of that connectedness. So it almost seems scary to imagine this evolution of love and connectivity being dependent on a continuous like purging of pain and how much pain can we handle in our, in our experience of developing love. I was thinking though, so um, Jared Diamond in Gunstreams and Steel, which came out a long time ago, talked about how when you um, when you brought up the world and how we're separated, there some separateness is good for um, invention and um, understanding and um, you know being able to to try new things and then bring it back to a whole and. There is, um, there can be a beauty in um, some disintegration because there can be that um, spark of new ideas and new embodiments or new senses of who we are as humans and how we're connected. And, and I think there can be some really interesting things that happen in that separateness as long as it comes back and we can all learn from it. And, um, and I think, you know, holding on to to that, um, the wholeness becomes like a monoculture. And I, I think we don't, we're not looking for something like that, um, but, you know, understanding our connectivity, but also our differences and, and the beauty in those differences and learning from each other, um, I think is really important as, uh, as we develop from that, um, both in a spiritual and intellectual and embodied sense. Thank you, Jamie and um, and Lucian, and and really thank you so much, Rachel, for for your deep vulnerability. Um, I'm, you know, you mentioned that that's what you were embodying, and and Sarah was was asking me like, what what am I feeling? And it was the total opposite of you, but but this is what is integral, and I'm so glad you voiced it out because we needed your perspective in this to understand what integral means and if that's what you're feeling that that needs to be integrated into what we're doing and so really deeply appreciated and there's a yeah. lot a lot of work to be done i totally am with you it can get so intellectual and we want to strive to sort of not entirely move away from it but integrate it on a deep level with intuition and embodiment and love and and so I just bow to you, a deep bow to you for, for voicing that out. And for Tiffany, and to Tiffany, I'm, I think there was some kind of intuition train going on there, oh, but no. you know, thank you. Thank you so much for um, asking Rachel to speak up. Yeah, I, I wanted to just pick up a thread that's kind of briefing what Jamie's saying and what is an integral impact, right? There's like, it seems like what is integral is such a deep topic that 
deserves its own three hours as all of our heart, mind, spirits come together and unpack, you know, ourselves. But what is integral impact? Like some thoughts I just wanted to share. It's like, I think about the first computer ever was used for, uh, for creating carpets, I believe, was invented by, I think, a woman. There's a computer history museum in, in, uh, in Silicon Valley. And so that was the first computer, right? It was just to make carpets. So it's like, you think about how lame that is and what computers have become and what they have enabled the world of computers we live in today. And I think it's the same gonna be with integral impact. One thing I'm sensing is integral is gonna require integration and separation to coexist, you know, because if it gets too integrated, we're trying to pull everybody into what I think or you think, you know, it's like we're losing the diversity. So it's like, how do we continuously have the regenerative flow of diversity while leaving space open for new combinations to keep coming together? And that's one of the beauty of mechanistic reductionism is that we've stripped the world into its parts. So we now have an opportunity to bring it back together, you know, and so we don't have to condemn reductionism uh, as having had no value and what Rick Tarnas would call an evolutionary, uh, you know, wrong door or something like that. Um, so when I think about integral impact, there's an element of working with the world, right? So I'm thinking of, you know, Malcolm X idea of like black businesses, right? And somebody may look at that and say, okay, black owned businesses, like that's not very integral because you're missing a whole bunch of society there. You're just focusing on one small community. But for somebody coming from that uh, group, socioeconomic group, I think that is one vision of what integral may mean to them. But you, you may have some Christian missionary who is a you know, coming from a white Anglo-Saxon background, and they have their own version of what integral means. So I think for all of us, starting from where we are, thinking about that very first computer being just to make carpets, I think our version of integral projects are going to look really sloppy and messy and they won't be integrating everything uh you know i i recall um you know somia uh challenging me to say for numinous realm what's your mission you know and i would always say to her look my goal right now is to create something financially sustainable because we can figure the mission out you know and is that fair for me to say maybe it's fair maybe it's not maybe i need to have the mission the philosophical vision figured out right now but for me, getting the financial stability is very important, right? But for Somia as a change maker, maybe the mission and vision is very important. So I just want to leave room here for us. Clearly, there's some ideas that we're all connecting on. And at the same time, there's we're, we are very different people from different backgrounds and the world moves through us differently. So I just want to leave room for the messiness of the integral impact to just be really sticky, awkward, and weird when it first comes out. And it may be like my integral project is going to step on someone else's toes and they're going to just be like, that's not integral. You know, it's just like when we're talking about dubstep or rap music and someone's like, that's not really dubstep, you know, but someone else is like, oh yeah, like this is my kind of, or this is, you know, like when little, little Yachty came out and I'm like, that's not rap music, but a lot of people are like, that is rap music, you know? So I just want to leave room for that messiness of what is integral impact. And it's not a technical clear thing. It's going to be an ugly potato, you know, for each of us. Ugly potato. <laughs> I, I heard an integral entrepreneur say, uh, know your audience or know your, is that right there? Know your target group. So wherever your target group is, situated developmentally or culturally whatever and then know what their problem is from their perspective and then solve the problem uh, integrally and then that's your product i thought hmm, that makes sense but don't use integral language to talk about it in that conversation with your client necessarily i thought hmm. That's interesting. I keep thinking about the, the food truck business. Is it an integral food truck or a non-integral food truck? And I heard another example of a, of a, um, a building 
uh, like an apartment building. So uh, in Toronto, that this this uh, this guy one generation ago he he basically used integral thinking for his apartment building. And usually, like owners of apartment buildings are you know called slum lords or whatever. And and you know so not such a glamorous job to own and manage uh, a building. But he went in with, and he and his wife, um, you know, both had read lots of Integral, and and he basically he ran the building in a way that it was integral and that it took care of the whole person's needs. He would even like he would take his superintendents, and usually he would find people who um, who would come and live in his building that didn't have a lot of um, uh, formal education and perhaps were chronically living in poverty and then he would uh, invest in them developing their skills to look after the building but then also be able to um, take those skills uh, elsewhere and people when they when they left the building um, be in a in a position that they were set up to take off in their life and I thought you know that's uh, like a building management using an integral lens makes that whole living experience and the purpose and the how um, integral is by the way that they did it that example gave me lots of food for thought in terms of integral impact when it impacts the holistic health like all aspects of uh, an individual's health and then you know, it starts with the individual and then the, the next and rippling out into bigger and bigger, broader circles of, of care. But even if the impact is only on a single individual or even just on yourself, it's still an integral impact perhaps, and that will ripple out eventually. So that's some thoughts I had about impact. Yeah, um, what you're saying is, is um, giving me sort of like an imagination of impacting another as um, like what if integral impact is that your interaction with another, your impact on another is actually um, a witnessing of their impact on you. Like how does, how does the individuality in front of you as the, as the, percept of your impact actually um, result in an unfolding of them. And like your exchange is oriented around being a witness to their coming into the world. And, and, and the impact is like them on the world in, in your gaze kind of, as opposed to I will impact you and experience my impact on you. It's more like I will impact you by experiencing you come into being. I love this. And as both of you are talking, I'm thinking about, Vera and I just watched the We Work documentary last week. I don't know if anyone's seen that. Okay, it seems like Jamie has. And Which one? We, we Work, you know, you know, We Work, it's just a documentary on, We Work is like that big co-working space, a big company. Oh, okay. And so, Basically, this guy, Adam Newman, who, who started WeWork, I can I now see what he did as quite integral, even though he does he did he probably wouldn't call what he did integral. And and you know, Lucien and I at, uh, know from Devashish when we, we asked, you know, I asked him, uh, does one need to know that they're doing integral yoga to be doing integral yoga? And he said, No, you know, you could be doing something integral without knowing that you're doing something integral. So that's what I feel he was doing because he created a co-working space. He's changing the way we work. And that's what he did. That's amazing that creating a, a space where everyone can work together, like how integral, how much more integral can it get? And now, you know, when you're talking about this idea of the impact and the integral, he, he basically inspired everyone to be integral. He got so consumed by the impact that he had that he became corrupted the impact took over the integral in the, in that case. And so I wonder, this is really, it's getting so kind of metaphysical now, like 
now like how, can you can you even can you even deconstruct that can it remain together will will integral take over impact or will impact take over integral <laughs> you know that, that that's a question that is coming up for me now and uh yeah, if anyone else has uh, something else to say, otherwise we are hitting time, but I just want to leave it open for any other last comments. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, shout out to uh, this and PCC graduate started Subtle Activism. The guy's name is David Nichols, I think with his wife, he started a nonprofit. And so Subtle Activism is based on this idea of like, we're trying to make a change in the world, let's just all meditate on it, or let's do a coordinated meditation so that's what came up when I heard Lucien and Sarah talking. It's like, that's also impact, you know, you could just be sitting there meditating and that is a type of impact. So it's going to be crazy to see the diversity of what is integral impact. And yet, can you still put a label on it and call it under the same umbrella? You know, is Adam Newman, if that's integral impact and somebody meditating is also integral impact. Um, but great question, Somi, on, on you know, the tension at the heart of integral and impact are they intention or 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 not? Well, I still have the smell of the croissant and the cafe on the. What did you say? Dripping from the tip of my nose. Yeah, I, I think mm. actually, um, I I believe. Um, Rachel and Jodi Ann and Jamie, you may have missed my 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 visualization at the beginning. So I, I just did a little bit to take people back into Paris in the 20th century and you know Gertrude Stein's salon with Picasso and Hemingway. And I said at the beginning, I said, as you walk by these cafes, the smell of sweet buttery croissants and dark roasted coffee lingers at the tip of your nose. So that, that, that's what I said. <laughs> I was wondering. I if heard it, but I, I was waiting for Josephine Baker to oh, say bye or oh, something. Like I was I'm, waiting for her. <laughs> Josephine Baker was a huge part of that, uh, of that period. Yes, I, I, I actually looked up, I researched to see who attended Gertrude Stein's salons and, and her name did not pop up, but she was definitely a big part of that culture during that period. Thank you for bringing that up, Rachel. I'm really superficial. I was just thinking about what I was wearing and enjoying that. It was silk. It was blue. I had a great hat. Was a feather involved anywhere? I need to know. Jo Jodianne, were you going to say something? I don't know if I cut you off. I'm sorry. I just, no, I was going to ask if you wrote it, but if you wrote it or if you were reading it from something. And I, I like Rachel's question for Sarah, if you were wearing feathers, were there feathers on your head or involved in your, uh, in your outfit, Sarah? I like that question. Um, I think there was definitely one right here. Felt it, I felt I it. It was saw large. You. I saw you with your feathers. <laughs> and I was thinking about all of the gender relationships and I sat down in that chair and I spread out my skirt and I was like, here I am, equal. Thank you for the cafe. Let's go. I'm glad you all are Um, I was going to say one more thing. Actually, I don't know. Jamie, did you have something you wanted to share? No? Okay. All right. I well, just wanted, can yeah. I just, <laughs> I don't know why I keep coming to these because I, they're just, I feel like we talk about stuff that I don't know how to apply it to um, my project, but but it's, um, but I say that because there are lots of things I'm not attending. I'm, I'm signing up for all of these things and then I just blow them off. But these, I always keep coming back to because they make me think so much. I mean, I know we talked about embodiment and how important that is, but, but it makes me think in such a different direction. And I have no idea even yet. Well, that's not a lot. That's not true. I do know a little bit about how it's impacting my project, but it's, so on what I not I didn't expect any of this and it's been wonderful and I just wanted to say that I don't I don't know how I keep I don't know what it's doing for me but it's obviously doing something because I keep coming back oh thank you thank you so why do you apply to the to the pit the showcase study <laughs> are people can people still do that yeah, yeah you can <laughs> 
how many people are signed up? So right now we have six. So you will be the seventh one and we would really love that. And, and Rachel as well. Please don't be, you know, scared to do this. It's, it's really casual. I mean, yes, of course, we have maybe four people who might get $500. But I mean, even if you don't get it, you got a chance to share your, your idea with the world. And I think that that is a way of manifesting it, just putting it out into the world. And you might get it. Yeah, and you might get it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we're begging to give it away. Yeah, we really are, to be honest. So please, <laughs> uh, you got to take the money from CIS, right? <laughs> so please do. And um, yes, thank you all for, for coming. And I just want to leave you with a, a small, uh, you know, a short phrase by, by Haridas Chaudhry, who is actually the founder of our school. Um, and he, he really talks about this idea of integral being diversity in unity. And, and that's just what I want to leave you with. It's diversity in unity. That's what we're trying to do here. So thank you all for coming. This was a really profound conversation. It has to continue. It will continue. Um, a lot of love to sending you all a lot of love. Take care. Thanks, Good night. everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye. Good night.